Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, as Kat says, I'm James Bridal. Um, I've had a lot of, I have a background in computer science and in publishing. Um, I've been a fiction editor. I've also helped build e-reading applications. Um, I write about a lot of what I do at book2.org, a site that I've been doing for a few years. Um, I, uh, I do some strange things, sort of material explorations in the book. Uh, that sometimes come out as things that look like publishing imprints and sometimes come out looking like art projects. Um, and generally, I, I like to think and talk about the book a lot. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the last few days. It's been fascinating. It's been wonderful. Lots of chatter, lots, quite a lot of arguments. It's always good. Uh, there's been a... It's been one, one of the things that struck me this morning, Kevin Kelly's talk, there was a lot of chatter around his talk about... Uh, things moving towards free and the value of the book and what that means for us. Um, and I think it's really important that while it's obvious that we're in a time of massive change, uh, you can say change as many times as you like, but it doesn't really matter unless you really dig deep into understanding what that means and what it means for us and start to reassess what it is that we as publishers do now. Um, I want to bring up this example, which is from the New York Times book review. This just flicking through this weekend. And this is what I was seeing. I was seeing a lot of pictures like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. Um, this is a very small sample, but it is pretty representative. Um, these are pack shots, pack shots with these little quotes attached to them. And this is how we try to sell books. And this is how we, a lot of the time, this is how we talk to our readers. And then you turn the page, and you see this. And this is a pack shot as well, but it's a pack shot that very explicitly frames the text that talks about, that, that says that what we are doing here is reading. Um, this is that horrible TV ad with a smug lady, but the important thing is it is two people reading by the pool. This is what they are doing. They are reading. Um, uh, here she is again, possibly a different lady. This is Amazon refuting the idea that you can't read an e-book anywhere while, reading a, while wearing a bikini. Um, but it's, it's central to how they communicate. Uh, it's constantly about the reading process. These are from a, a brochure for the Sony reader that I picked up in, in Milan last week. Um, this is sort of ground zero for a new blog called hotchicksreadingereaders.tumblr.com. Um, I'm sorry for the inherent sexism in that, but I suggest you speak to Sony and their stereotypical view of Italians. Um, or just go to Italy. It looks nice. Um, the masters of this, of course, are Apple. Um, I don't think Apple have got e-books or books in general right, but they know about experiences. Here they are on the subway, on the bus stops, on the subway again, and what they're showing people, what they're saying to their customers, who should be our customers, but they barely are, they're saying that what, what we are selling you is the reading experience, that beautiful, wonderful, extraordinary time you spend with a book. This is Penguin Ads from Singapore. Uh, this trap line, which you can barely read, there is escape into a book. Again, what they're selling here is not, the, not a particular book, but the reading experience and the joy of that. This isn't a talk about advertising particularly, but it is a, supposed to be a talk about how we talk to our customers and how we talk about what we do and how we understand what we do. Um, only Penguin could probably run ads like this. They're the only ones I've seen doing it because they've got such a strong brand. But they are talking about a particular thing. This is the best ad I've ever seen for books, and it's for TV. It's uh, Ian McEwan walking in the Oxfordshire Hills near his home, thinking about writing. It's about that time. If there's one extraordinary thing that books have is this quality of time, and the value of the books lies in the time that we spend with them, and the time that we spent writing with them as well. That's why I think this is so significant, to show an author writing, to show that time that value that goes into creating the book. I do a lot of thinking about books, as I said. Um, the, uh, and I've been talking to people about ebooks for a long time. Uh, and you hear all these different, uh, different views of books. And the things you hear all the time are quite the same. People are obsessed with the physicality of the book. Uh, they talk about its paper qualities, the, the, the feel of the paper, the smell of the new book. People are always sniffing books. It's very strange. Um, they're slightly obsessed with it. But 
I think there's a reason they're obsessed with it. It's because the paper book fulfills certain qualities in our lives that we're concerned about losing in the move to e-books. And these aren't, necess these aren't actually physical qualities. They're temporal qualities. They're the way that the book exists in time. So I've been doing a lot of thinking recently about how people use books and how they interact with them. Um, Bookmarks are a really obvious one. I spend a lot of time people talking to people about how they, how they bookmark books. There's all these incredible strategies that people have. Um, they dog ear them, they turn down the corners, they underline things. People have all these different strategies for how they bookmark as well. Some people turn down the top corner um, to mark a place. Um, I turn down the top corner all the way through a book and I never go back to it, which is rubbish, and I hope we can solve that. Um, these are what my books look like after the end. Physical books show the marks of their own experience and of our own experiences with them. Um, there's things that we do with books and ways that we interact with them that uh, we don't know how to translate into other experiences yet. Um, how do you write your name in the front of an e-book? How do you possess it in the same way as you do a regular book? Um, or a paper book, I should say, because they're not becoming very regular anymore. Um, the, uh, what I mentioned there about Ian McEwan earlier, I think, is really significant. Um, it's quite strange to me that we, we don't really talk about how books get made, how they come to be. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how we can start to, uh, to put some of this back into the books themselves, how we can start to represent the real time that books occupy. Um, I think about my, probably my favorite line in, in favorite single line in Ulysses, which is the last line of the book, and it's not Molly's ecstatic, yes, yes, yes. It's the very final line after that, which is Joyce's own. And it just says, Trieste, Vienna, Paris, 1914 to 1921. And you think, seven years? Jesus, I thought it took me a long time to read it. <laughs> like, there's a, a making visible, this extraordinary creative process that goes into the book. Books fulfill all these kind of functions that we don't really think about very much, or at least we haven't thought about previously. The paper book exists on these multiple timelines that are really quite extraordinarily powerful. Um, the physical book starts out as an advertisement for itself. Uh, that, that when you see it in the bookstore sitting there, or even when you see it online, that we really need to start rethinking covers. Uh, the, they act as an advertisement for themselves. Um, and they act as a locus of our conversations about them and how we think about them and how we talk about them. And then we read them. And it's interesting that for so long, the reading process has been pretty much opaque to us. As, as publishers, um, we, we, we kind of, there's always been this feeling that we kind of let go when, uh, when readers pick up a book. Uh, that stops becoming any of our business, essentially, which, which is a strange thing. And, and our competitors, uh, our new competitors, have understood that very well for a long time. If you, you know, if, if Amazon has built that sort of thing into itself forever, into comments, into people talking about the books, into people reviewing the books, about owning the conversation around the book itself. Um, but still, even then, the reading process itself has remained this kind of black hole. And yet that's where the magic happens. That's the fun bit. That's, that's the most extraordinary part of books, that time that we spend with them, reading them. And then after all that as well, books become souvenirs. It's one of these incredible qualities of the physical book that I'm not sure really exists in any other media, that books are souvenirs of themselves. It's why we put them on our bookshelves. It's why we like to show them off. Uh, there's all these other features they fulfill as well. They're kind of peacock feathers. Uh, we, we, we really like to show them off. When we're reading them, we haven't figured out how to, uh, how to pick someone up in a cafe because you don't know what they're reading yet. Uh, but you also can't show off when someone comes around your house and sees all your books on the shelves. So there's this whole wealth of experience that's tied to the paper book that we haven't yet figured out in e-books. And it's really important that we do, because there's this cognitive dissonance that's happening so far. But it's also a massive opportunity. Because as publishers, this is what we do. This is what we care about. This is what we're incredibly passionate about. 
Um, so we need to get involved in the reading process, and we need to communicate this better to our readers. Um, so uh, trying to be uh, practical about this, trying to get some interesting things. Um, this is something I built a few years ago. It's quite old now. It's very creaky. In fact, I think it's probably broken. Um, but it is a few years old. Um, and it's called Bookkeeper. And it was a very simple reading service. And it was based on SMS and Twitter. And it allowed you to track what you were reading. Um, it's the absolute kind of bare bones of a reading tracking service. Um, and yet, I was amazed by the response to it. Here's a guy who is annotating the whole of Hegel's essential writings. Um, he's doing this by text message. He's typing these quotes into his mobile phone. And if that doesn't convince you of something about the urge to share an archive, um, I'm not quite sure what would. There's a huge, huge urge to do this. Um, and then you get magnificent things like this. Um, so someone built on top of the Bookkeeper API, and again, this is several years old and a bit shonky, but this is simply a record of the pages that someone has read. So you can see in this, this user, this is the number of pages they've read over time. It looks at the books they've finished, and it compares them to the page count on Amazon. It says, here you go. This is your achievement. This is what you've done. And you can show this off, too. This is, an, this is a way towards the kind of souvenir qualities of the book. And this is a much more modern version. This is a, a service uh, from a startup in Europe called Readmill. They're doing fantastic things around tracking this kind of aspect of the reading. So you can see your activity. You can see when you read and how you read. You can see the time spent on the book. And we can see that as well. Publishers can see that as well. And they can see the passion of readers in the books. And they can see the way readers are responding to books. And they can engage in those conversations as well. And you can pull out all this kind of extraordinary data. And you can share it as well if you want. And I'm willing to bet a sizable number of people do. But it's important to remember that uh, the social qualities are add-ons. Uh, the point of social reading is that it allows, allows you to save and share these things. Um, but you don't have to do the sharing bit. You can use it for your own purposes. But if you do want to share, uh, it gives you incredible tools to do so, because sharing is a form of memory now. This is, this is where the impulse to share comes from. It's because we don't have physical things to hold on to anymore. Sharing becomes a form of distributed memory. And it starts to fulfill those other functions that we lose when we lose the paper book. So I'm doing a thing called Open Bookmarks. Uh, this is not really a plug. I'm not trying to sell you anything except possibly an idea that, uh, that the way in which we share in the future is absolutely central to our reading experience. In fact, it in large part is the reading experience when it comes to all the discussions that we have it and the, way, the place that books have in our lives. Um, open Bookmarks is an argument that says that uh, however you're reading and wherever you're reading, that experience that you're having should be shareable and it should be savable and it should belong, most importantly, to you because it's our experiences that are the most important thing. Um, so when you're reading a Kindle, for example, and Kindle's doing amazing things with bookmarking now, really fantastic things. When you're doing that, you should be able to save and export those bookmarks on whatever platform you're doing, and you should be able to import them as well to services like Read Mill or anyone else. And so the practical aspect of this, I think, is to say to publishers that you need to, we need to get involved in these sort of services and look at the way people are using our books and the way they're interacting with these services because this is where our books will live now. This is where people will find them and how they will interact with them. And so when you see people talking about book social services, when, you talk, when they're talking about social reading, when they're talking about e-reading or reading devices at all, then I'd suggest the questions you need to be asking are, how will my readers use this? How will this help my readers? How will my readers be able to move easily between these different services? How will I be able to interact with these services? What is my place as a publisher within these services as well? Um, the very first question, any e-reading platform, can I export all my activity? If I've bookmarked stuff, if I've, when, when I started it, when I finished it, is that data portable? And it gets very dry when you talk about data. Um, it gets quite complex. Um, and you know, we try and elucidate that openbookmarks.org is still pretty dry, but we're working on it. We're trying to start these conversations, think about it. data is quite dry, but 
I want to say one, one more dry graph, because I think this is important. Um, this is a graph that was shared with me by Peter Collingridge of Enhanced Editions. Um, so Enhanced Editions is an e-reading platform. Uh, you track your reading, and if you choose to, you can send a bit of data back, and that's uh, slowly becoming more pre prevalent. But this is a really fantastic graph, because um, what it shows is the blue bars are the number of people reading at any given time of day. And the, the time's a bit shifted because of time zones, but it's basically correct. But what's really interesting is the green line. The green line is the, number, is the length of time those people are reading for. This is, this is where they're reading and how they're doing it. Um, so you can make a pretty good assumption about what's going on here, because data are stories too. And you can pull extraordinary things out of this. Those people reading late at night, that's this. That's people reading. And this is, this is what we do. This is publishing, right? This is, a, this is where we should be. This is how we should think about what it is that we do. And it doesn't matter too much. It's really not important that these people are reading paper books rather than e-books. What they are doing is they're reading. The books themselves are subliming. They're going up into the air. They're, they're achieving what, what Walter Pater called the condition of music. But what will remain of them is our experiences, the absolutely central experience of reading. And as publishers, what we've always been most passionate about is books and reading and our involvement in that process and the sharing of our passion in that process. And so this, this is where we need to be, and this is what we should be doing. Thank you very much.